Thank you, Angela, and thank you to the organizers. Having just come off of a big global meeting, I really appreciate all that work, all the work that goes into this, and truly it's blood, sweat, and tears, but <laughs> this is a successful meeting, and I did hear Dominic say that you did no advertising, so that's a testament to how rapidly this area is growing. Uh, okay, I have no commercial relationships to d disclose. And I just want to start out by defining ketogenic diet therapy because I, I'll, many of us that work in this like to take the word diet out of there and talk more about the therapy because it, it really is a therapy that encompasses um, several components. So on the diet end, um, this is highly simplified, but fat is the main source of calories. And a lot of people take days, weeks, and months to digest this mentally and to wrap their heads around it. So um, we talk about it up front and get them used to this concept. Protein is provided to meet needs. I'll come back to that a little bit later. And carbohydrate is minimized. And this is individualized to specific goals. And again, I'll come back to this. The therapy part is that there is a huge emotional adaption. And having been a nutritionist for many, many years, um, I came upon this diet sort of by default, and having worked with all of the therapies in hospital setting, renal diets, diabetic diets, um, cystic fibrosic diets, et cetera, I, I, there was none that came close to the powerful results that I saw with this, and I decided after my first child that this was it for me, that I was gonna only do this for the rest of my career. Um, Hydration needs to be part of the therapy. I'm going to come back to that. Micronutrient supplementation is critical. And fasting is something I talk to every single person that I work with, um, but I have to define that because fasting simply means without food. So what do we mean? For some, it might be just going without food for 12 hours, which is supposed to be what we're you know, all supposed to do. Um, we don't eat during the night. And um, uh, 10 or 12 hours, is not hard to do. Some people need longer fasting. I fast myself every Monday, starting uh, Sunday after dinner. So I'll go either 24 or 36 hours. So I invite my patients to join me in solidarity. And um, that seems to be very helpful. Um, and sometimes we go longer, but this is very individualized depending on what goal uh, the therapy has for them. Um, and then laboratory studies, uh, we do quite a bit in children that have epilepsy, which is the first application that I uh, used this therapy for for about 10 years. And we did quite a bit of blood work. Um, however, I know that this is not possible everywhere. And I, I believe that these are the minimum uh, laboratory studies that should be done on anyone for a couple of reasons. One, for safety, but also to prevent people from coming off the diet early if something does look abnormal. Of, oftentimes there's abnormalities before starting someone on the therapy and um, they can improve on the diet. So I use it you know, for safety, but also to help keep people on the therapy to prove that um, they're doing fine. So um, since we're talking so much about science, I had to throw this slide in. This is how I approach people. This is a N of one trial, and that simply means that the single patient is the um, entire trial. So again, it's a very individualized therapy. And I'm gonna give you a, two examples um, from the uh, low end of the spectrum in terms of control to a very controlled therapy. So this is pretty typical of a lot of people that I work with that come to me with migraine headache. Um, and apparently it's 15% of females that have this disorder, about 10% in males. And I run into this frequently just in my personal circle of friends and family. But this particular woman, 32-year-old female with migraine headaches for about eight years, um, she was trialed on topiramate, which is actually an anti-seizure medication, and um, it made her very dopey, so she stopped taking it. She was hospitalized twice for dehydration due to nausea, nausea and vomiting from a migraine, and if any of you have ever had a migraine, it's very debilitating, and um, you just want to die. It's just, you just feel, you know, horrible. Um, GIY, she had constipation and uh, endocrine, she was moderately obese. 
um, diet-wise, skips breakfast, eats convenience foods for lunch, uh, but she has a, a dinner with a family that is usually home-cooked foods. So I'm just showing you some of the pertinent um, details from her her history and her intake and not everything. Social-wise, she's a full-time graduate student, two school-age kids, her husband um, is very supportive and she had mentioned to me several times that her life is very, very stressful and she's also sedentary. So um, I asked her to keep a food diary, which I knew was gonna be difficult because she hardly had time to go to the bathroom. Um, so she said, what about if I just send you pictures of what I'm eating? And I said, that's perfectly fine. So, um, you know, I asked her for honesty, just be honest with me. I'm, I'm your therapist, I'm not here to judge you, I'm here to help you. So she sent me, um, this is one day of her diet. Now these are, are not all of the foods that she ate, but these are the ones that I picked out as being problematic. And um, she started her morning with a latte, um, and she thought she was eating a very healthy yogurt for lunch, and she'd have a snack in the afternoon of some type of bar, and then she always carried um, a beverage along with her to sip on during the day, and then um, this nice big muffin from Costco. Um, and this is just, part of her day, but right here, well over 200 grams of carbohydrate, right? So this brings me to something that I discuss with everybody at some point in time who um, eats like this, uh, whether they want to try ketogenic or not, but are seeking my advice. And that's this thing called sugar addiction. And it's very real. And we all have it. Even I am sugar addicted, even though I don't eat sugar. It would be very easy for me to go back to it. And I, even, I am tempted, even though I'm in ketosis and my appetite is you know, very normalized, we all have this. And this has been proven in mice, and I, and I regret not throwing my slide in here, citing the study, um, actually it was rats. But um, uh, rats were fed or offered a choice between cocaine and sugar. And which did they pick? They picked sugar. So it is you know, a physiological addiction. And once we talk about that and recognize it, you know, we can embrace this a little bit easier rather than just thinking, you know, I can eat whatever I want, and I like, being, I like being able to not restrict myself. But we put it in terms of an addiction, and then we start to stay back, sit back and say, oh my gosh. I can't help myself. Um, we see people uh, totally getting off of sugar once they go into ketosis, and it's not a problem for them anymore. This is, this is something pretty magical about being in ketosis. It just, they just have such satiation from all the fat that they're getting that they're not tempted um, as much. Some are, but we have people that so-called cheat. I call that an experiment. What did you learn from it when you went and had something? Um, that's not cheating, and it's an experiment. But anyways, coming back to this woman with migraine, her goal was to eliminate migraines. Um, and she used the word desperate. I am desperate. I, our, my life is just a mess. And I can't imagine living like this. So our first plan was not even to talk about ketogenic diet. I said, let's just clean up your diet. And, and she was perplexed by that. What do you mean clean up my diet? I think I eat pretty healthy. Um, so I said, you know what, let's give this like a month and see how you do with cleaning up your diet. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. And then our plan B will be to go on to a, a ketogenic diet. So she bought into that. and. Um, this is something that I developed with the Charlie Foundation. It's called a whole foods diet. It's sugar-free and gluten-free. And why is it gluten-free? Well, the classic ketogenic diet designed in 1923 is a gluten-free diet. People don't refer to it as that, but just by nature of the limited carbohydrate, we are eliminating grains. So it's a gluten-free diet, and of course it's sugar-free. And um, we put this together to show people these are the foods on a ketogenic diet it's unlimited in this step. You can eat what you want, but it teaches you to eat fat. 
So th this is just the top half of the, fir the first page. There's four pages of this, and we are giving this out at the Charlie Foundation table, so you're welcome to, um, to see the rest of it. But it starts off with uh, recommending protein and then fat, and the carbohydrate is below this, and then we go on to explain um, more in detail uh, a week's worth of rest or, uh, menus and alternatives to pasta and bread and this type of thing. But um, more, most importantly, it teaches people they have to eat fat with each meal. And why is that important? I'm going to come back to it. One thing I did want to talk to her about right away is alternatives to what she was doing to help give her some practical guidance. She just had to have her caffeine in the morning, which is uh, totally fine and pretty common among all of us. Um, uh, very evident by the line every morning, <laughs> every midday, and every afternoon outside um, the bulletproof table. And I'm, I'm at the table right next to them, so I've been actually helping them put cups out because uh, the line is so long that nobody can see me. So, um, so here we go. Do I have a, oh, here's my pointer. So what can we do instead of the latte? Well, if you've had their coffee, you know it's they're putting butter into coffee. Some people like um, cream in coffee. You get a little bit more fat and calories with the butter, and it's very low carb. What about that yogurt, that healthy, apparently healthy yogurt that's loaded with sugar? There are high-fat Greek yogurts, and you can put just a little bit of berries in there, just a little handful of berries. Very satisfying. Why is there so much sugar? in this sports bar. Okay, we have recipes for seed crackers, uh, chia seeds, flax seeds, etc. and companies are coming out with these products so that they're more convenient. Um, this is on the right is uh, kombucha, which um, I'm going to come back to a little bit later, but uh, a very healthy low carb, although some of them have fruit juices added to them, but you want to look for the lower carb one. I've gotten people off of their laxatives with this. I've gotten people off of drinking diet soda all day, which um, I'm going to come back to later. And then what about that muffin? Again, there are products, you've had some of them here coming out in the market in the past few years that are great alternatives, or people can make these at home. There's great recipe uh, booklets and book, cookbooks available these days. So what about non-food carbohydrates? These can be a significant source of carbs for some people. Um, I know of uh, people who drink sports beverages like it was water, right? Two or three times, two or three bottles of this uh, Gatorade, high carb drink. And they do make low carb ones um, that, that are fine, but watch out for the carb in sports drinks. What about medications? We have to really watch for this in children because most children's medications are either syrups, elixirs, or chewable tablets that are sweetened to help get them down. These can be significant. What happens if you go into the hospital? What do they hook up right away? An IV with dextrose, that's sugar. So they can give you an IV without sugar. You have to ask for it. 20% um, dextrose means there's 20 grams of carbohydrate in a liter. So the first thing that I did when I went in to visit a patient in the hospital who had come in uh, urgently for something non-epilepsy non, um, related is walk over to the IV bag and make sure there was no dextrous in the IV because that often got overlooked even in the hospital. What about sweeteners? Well, sweeteners are 100% carbohydrate. It doesn't matter how natural they are, honey and agave nectar and coconut syrup. Their carbohydrate. Um, questionable sweeteners. There's a study just from a few years ago that looked at um, the microbe um, uh, quality of the gut after giving mice artificial sweeteners, and it not only altered the microbiota, but they found that it affected glucose tolerance. So that's done in mice. Um, there are studies coming out soon in adults showing what happens with um, artificial sweeteners and also what happens on ketogenic therapy. I can't wait for that one to come out. Um, but the other point is that when you're in ketosis, it alters your taste buds 
and it magnifies the acuity of, acuity of sweetness. So I can eat something and say, oh my gosh, that's so sweet. And my husband can eat the same thing and say, this is really bland, okay? We don't need the sweetening um, in foods once we're in ketosis. Okay, coming back to this woman with migraines, after nine months, she was migraine-free. Um, she was spilling trace in small ketones in her urine. Our goal was not to go into ketosis, but what was happening is that she was burning her own body fat, and that was uh, contributing to ketones. She lost 15 pounds. That wasn't what we focused on, but it inherently happened. And when we talk about calorie restriction, people think about, oh, do I have to count my calories? And no, we don't count calories. But when you, auto when you eat a whole foods diet, you automatically are calorie restricting. It just happens because you don't overeat, especially when you're incorporating fat. So this is wonderful that I don't have to explain you're on a calorie-restricted diet, you just don't know it. You can eat as much of these lower-carb vegetables as you want, um, stay within the fat limits that I've advised, but pretty much they can fill up, and they feel very satisfied, and they don't overeat. So it's a caloric restriction um, by design, uh, not by intent. Um, she also reported that she wasn't as hungry as before. She was going three or four hours and skipping snacks, right? So this is a culture here where we graze all day long. We have food available everywhere we turn. And um, she was passing up the treats, and there uh, alone was some caloric restriction over what she had pre previously been doing. Her cholesterol and LDL went up, and if any of you listen to David Diamond, you know that this is not something to be concerned about. Um, it went up because she was losing weight and she was breaking down fat, so it was mobilizing the cholesterol in her body. It eventually came down. About nine months out, we saw it normalize. Um, she got off of her commercial laxatives, which is something I spend lots of time talking to people about and telling them, I'm gonna ask you about your bowel uh, habits. You're just gonna have to get used to it, but it's very important to know that you are having a bowel movement, um, if not every day, then every other day. Okay, so the plan was, let's just continue this whole foods diet, making sure she's getting about three tablespoons of fat with each meal, which I figured was about 50% of her calories. And um, this is, at 50% is barely ketosis, but uh, again, she has some more fat to lose, and we aren't focusing on weight loss. That wasn't one of her goals, but we, we know that that's just a benefit of, of her eating this way. Um, Case history number two is somebody with epilepsy. This is a 13-year-old girl with intractable epilepsy. That, that means uh, seizures that are resistant to standard therapy. She was trialed on seven different anti-epileptic drugs um, and currently uh, was on CBD oil, which is uh, cannabidiol oil from hemp. Um, and she, the, the drugs not only didn't help her seizures, she was suffering some from adverse side effects of the drugs, with the oil, she was um, not suffering any side effects, and she had months of pretty good seizure control, but then started to fall apart. Um, the family had been trying a modified Atkins diet on their own. There's a lot of information on the internet, so they were doing this on their own. But I had them check her glucose and report it to me in the morning, and I was a little suspicious that it was it was normal, but at the high end of normal, especially for a young person, and her ketones were trace. So they, you know, they made great attempts to um, follow what they thought was a, a ketogenic diet, but just needed some help um, structuring that a little bit more. She was at her ideal body weight. Um, she was also doing gluten-free, and um, the eldest of two children, active when she's not having seizures, and she verbalized that she would do anything to control her seizures. She just knew that her life was um, a mess. And so for this family, I gave them, again, a Charlie Foundation publication to show them the different ketogenic therapies that are in the literature. And so the therapy, the four different therapies that have been published pretty extensively are at the top, and this is the classic ketogenic diet and the MCT oil diet. 
both designed in the 1920s. Uh, I also have this out at the table if anybody wants a copy. Low glycemic index treatment, this is a, a hybrid ketogenic diet, and then modified Atkins, another hybrid diet. So the first three rows, you see they're all yeses. Is it medically supervised? Is it high in fat? Is it low in carbohydrates? This is what they have in common. And then we start to see the logistics differ quite a bit as we go down. What is the ratio of fat to carbohydrate and protein? In the classic ketogenic diet, we, we can actually modulate it because it's so structured. We can modulate it to any ratio. The MCT oil diet is about a one-to-one. -one, and the low glycemic index is also about a one-to-one. -one, and modified Atkins is a little higher, about a two-to-one. How much carbohydrate would be allowed on 1,000 calories? Ooh, excuse me pushing too hard here. On 1,000 calories, um, you can see the 4 to 1 is the most strict in carb, 3 to 1, 16, 2 to 1, 30, and 40 to 60 on a 1 to 1. The MCT oil diet between 40 and 50, low glycemic between 40 and 60, and these, no matter how many calories, this is the carbohydrate restriction. And then modified Atkins, the stipulation is we, you start off with about 10 grams for adolescents or 15 grams for adults for about a month, and then you uh, liberalize it um, to about 20 grams. And then again, this is very individualized. These are just like starting places for all of these therapies. Um, how are foods measured? And these two uh, structured diets are either weighed or measured in, in household uh, measuring cups, tablespoons, teaspoons, low glycemic, measured or estimated, and modified is just estimated. Are meal plans used? Yes. And for modified Atkins, it's optional. Um, where's the diet started? These are, tend to be started in the hospital, although um, as a private practice nutritionist, I work with people at home. I just start them out much more gradually than we would in a hospital where we, we would start um, quickly and uh, we, we would rap, rapidly initiate them um, to get them home before the kid starts getting picky. Um, but I've done this safely and at long distances, people on the other side of the world, very gradually over weeks and even months, and it's quite safe. Um, and these two are meant to be done at home. Are calories controlled? Yes, on these first three. No, on modified Atkins. Are vitamin and mineral supplements used? Yes, across the board. Are fluids restricted? No, across the board. This is um, a myth uh, from long ago that you restrict fluids, um, and it related to the degree of ketosis in the urine. And now we have a much more um, sophisticated methods of checking for ketones um, that besides urine, and so urine, if you don't drink very much, your ketones get very strong because your urine is concentrated. We want people to drink on these therapies because the ketosis has a very strong diuretic effect. That means you lose fluid very easily, and so you need to replace that by drinking. Is our pre-diet laboratory evaluations required? Yes, across the board. And can there be side effects? Yes, across the board. So there's actually a lot more similarities in all these therapies than there are differences. It's just the logistics of teaching and managing. And again, as I said before, we may start somebody off um, very liberal and move them over to a more structured diet. And we tend to start children off on a very structured diet and then liberalize them to get them off or to maintain them. Um, and then um, we can move around between diets. So a uh, common um, uh, element of care is taking this MCT oil diet and using that MCT oil in these other three therapies. So experienced ketogenic nutritionists um, don't focus in on one specific diet other than to get it started and then work with the individual for tolerance and how they emotionally are adapting and then adjust it over time. So there's lots of flexibility. And then people with feeding tubes, um, we tend to use a very structured diet, and that's one of my specialties. I um, work with individuals that aren't able to eat orally and have feeding tubes, so we can blend up whole foods, just like anybody would be eating, and put them down a feeding tube. Um, and there's, there's commercial products available too, so there's lots of options. So going back to the second uh, case history, her goal was to eliminate seizures. 
um, and we wanted to start with a structured ketogenic diet. So she, she wasn't very active at the time, um, although she got more active. So we usually start off with a base, like goal calories for um, sedentary, and then add ketogenic snacks to make up for the activity, for the calories burned in activity. And they can double the snack or leave the snack out on a day that they're uh, not active. Um, 164 grams of fat, 62 grams of protein. This is about a gram per kilogram. And I can show you fancy uh, predictive equations for calculating protein. This is something that nutritionists love to get into and talk about and argue about. But um, it's, I, I can simplify that by saying we want to meet their protein needs. We can go as low as about 0.6 grams per kilogram and I've gone up as high as two grams per kilo. So it's very individual, and the more active somebody is, the more calories they're gonna take in, and there's more room for them to eat more protein. But one of the, the uh, mistakes I see commonly with people trying to do this on their own is that they're taking in too much protein because they have this idea that protein does not affect their glucose level. So I'll come back to that in a moment too. Whoops, excuse me. Um, she is uh, 20 grams of carbohydrate per day, which is what they were trying to do on their own. And then I had her monitor not only her glucose level, but her blood level of ketones. And Patricia is going to go into more about monitoring, so I'm not going to belabor that point. The hydration is really important. It's actually the first thing I teach somebody when we're talking about a ketogenic therapy that they have to be vigil about drinking every day. And once they get into that routine, it's second nature. But why, why? Dehydration causes your heart to pump faster, right? Water carries red blood cells with oxygen to cells. If you feel like you're getting sleepy sitting here for a couple hours, drink and you'll brighten up a little bit, right? And then water removes toxins from waste and from, the, uh, from um, waste products from the blood and sufficient hydration can prevent constipation and kidney stones. And the incidence of kidney stones actually on the ketogenic diet is no higher than it is for somebody just on a regular diet. Um, but because it's been reported, and we know that it can occur if you're not drinking enough, and I've only seen it in people that are taking drugs that also cause kidney stones. And there's a couple of anti-epileptic drugs that cause, can cause kidney stones. So um, sometimes there are passing a kidney stone, because I told them to start drinking once we get into the diet, and those kidney stones have been sitting there for a while. Now we're moving them out. So we pay attention to um, people that are complaining about uh, pain during urination and get them checked out right away, especially if they were on the medications that ca can cause kidney stones. So you've seen the slide several times from other speakers. I just want to remind you that you can get ketones through fasting. This is actually how the diet was invented many years ago. Um, and fat cells break down into fatty acids and convert to ketones in the liver, and those enter into the bloodstream. So again, we can check the ketones in the blood. We can check them crudely in the urine. And now we can also check them uh, by exhaled uh, breath. So, the ketogenic diet mimics fasting. Fat is the main source of calories. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about different types of fat, but the classic diet was actually based on uh, mostly uh, dairy fat, butter, and he heavy cream, heavy whipping cream. Now we've kind of modernized it by introducing monounsaturated fats and, and um, saturated fats like coconut oil and MCT oil. Carbohydrate is limited, and if I could feed everybody that I work with, I would feed them vegetables for their source of carbs. Now, not everybody is that um, uh, puristic about it, but they realize soon that they get more volume if they eat the lowest carbohydrate uh, vegetables. So. I also try to introduce them to rhubarb, which is a vegetable, but we think of it as a fruit, and how satisfying that can be. And you can usually get this year-round in, in freezers um, in the grocery store. So this, is, this has opened up 
lots of recipes for people that I work with, with either making it into smoothies or cooking it down and adding it to their, um, on their low carb crackers as like a jelly. And then berries, uh, because berries are the highest phytonutrient and highest fiber fruit and they're fairly low in carbohydrate compared to other fruit. And then protein, we try to encourage whole food sources, although things like bacon and sausage can work into the diet just as well. So I wanna step back again and talk a little bit about how those macronutrients affect glucose levels. Um, and I'm using a red line here to um, represent simple sugars. So when you eat that hard candy on the table back there, what happens is your glucose spikes up, right? We had hard candy on our table at the Banff meeting and I contacted the uh, banquet manager and I said, please go around and remove those from the table because they just put them out there, they don't ask you, right? Um, and so we don't think about this, this is just part of our culture, but this is what happens, your glucose rises quickly and then it falls within about an hour. And then we have complex carbohydrates, so fruits and whole grains, and it also rises and not as high and comes down. And then you consume protein. Protein actually, um, if you add it to carbohydrate, it slows down the curve, but then some protein gets converted to glucose, right? So then it eventually rises. And fat, which doesn't have a glycemic index at all, it doesn't raise your glucose, but if you add it to this mix, it actually lowers that glycemic index. It lowers that effect. So what happens with a ketogenic therapy? Well, we eliminate sugar, okay? And if you experiment with your diet and eat sugar, you're gonna find that it's gonna knock you out of ketosis. Uh, so you learn quickly that that's not a good experiment to repeat. All right, carbohydrate, we reduce significantly. Protein for most people is far less than what they had been eating. They don't realize that not just the chicken and the fish have protein, but vegetables have protein too, and it can be significant depending on which you pick. And most people are eating more than they really need, so we're bringing that down. And then fat is the main source of calories, so that lowers the glycemic index. And this is a, um, a glycemic curve in a child. I worked with children um, solely for about 10 years, and their glucose levels, no matter what ketogenic ratio we had them on, ranged between 55 and 75, and that was one of our um, ways to know if they were compliant. And it didn't matter what time of day you checked it, it was rock stable. With adults, I see it's between 10 and 20 points higher, and that's just the nature of the beast. So macronutrients interplay and one affects the other. Um, protein, as you know, is uh, essential for um, tissue maintenance and tissue growth, particularly in children. And sorry, here I'm snap happy here. Um, carbohydrate feeds the glycolysis pathway, but so does protein. Some proteins are glycolytic, so they'll feed into this glycolytic pathway. A lot of people don't realize fat which um, biochemically is triglycerides, is composed of a glycerol molecule plus three fatty acids. So when those split apart, the glycerol feeds the glycolytic pathway, and this is what's supporting glucose in the blood when we're not eating carb, okay? So one of the mistakes I see people make a lot is if we are getting low glucose below normal, below that low normal that we see with ketogenic, they automatically want to give somebody more carbohydrate. And um, typically, it's not that they need more carbohydrate, it's just they need more calories, and most of that is going to be from fat. So the second child, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to provide a structured ketogenic diet, and this is a snapshot from a keto diet calculator, again, uh, funded by the Charlie Foundation, and she is able to create meals, she or her parents, and I actually start the, started them out by designing some meals for her based on the goal of protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And um, she, her goals per meal are at the bottom. This is a two to one ratio, 600 calories. This is one of her three meals. She's, her meals are, eight, or her diet is 1,800 calories a day. So we don't talk in terms of breakfast, lunch, and supper. We just talk about meals 
because um, they're all interchangeable. And they're able to fluctuate um, if they want more protein in a meal and less carbohydrate, they can do that. Um, we just don't want them cheating out on the, pro on the protein. So this is a very structured, very organized way for them to get on track with uh, weighing foods and measuring them. And most people this age, teenagers, um, are capable of doing this for a while. And then they get the intuitive sense of the amounts and they can put the scale away. Okay, and that usually takes between one and three months of being on therapy and sometimes they come back to the scale of things go out um, off the rocker. So this is what our, our plan was with her and I keep showing you this picture in the background. This is one of her favorite meals. It's, it's, I'll show, um, and, and that's what you saw in the calculation. This is simply fish and this is a avocado mayonnaise with a little bit of lemon juice and Parmesan cheese and you just broil it. You, let, you put the uh, sauce over the top and broil it and it's truly delicious and it just takes a few minutes and then she's got all this broccoli here to go with it. So she was very compliant to this 82% fat diet. Her seizures didn't change until about two weeks and this is quite typical. Uh, with, with epilepsy, we don't see changes oftentimes right away. In fact, we suggest waiting three months to see a change. Um, but three months later, she's helping to prepare her own meals and um, seizure control c continues to improve. She's still having seizures, but not nearly as many. She's going back to school. She's starting to rejoin her activity. Um, and this is another typical day. I asked her what, she, what her favorite meals are. And she, like many teenage girls tend to um, want uh, vegetarian meals. That, that's a big thing in um, this age group. So they don't really like to eat much meat. Um, so here's a hemp hearts uh, porridge with chia seeds. And, and hemp hearts are very high in protein, so they work really well with this. Um, she's got, uh, we've encouraged her to do an, a tablespoon of MCT oil with each meal to help ketosis. Um, and this is a blender meal. She likes doing this uh, the night before and freezing it and taking it to school. She's got rhubarb. A cup is about three grams of carbohydrate. So it's quite low and there's a lot of fiber in it. She has a protein powder, a little bit of kale, olive oil, MCT oil, and water. And this is one of her favorite suppers, um, meatballs with a little marinara sauce, spaghetti squash with lots of butter, a little bit of Parmesan cheese. She's got a sprout salad here, MCT oil plus olive oil and vinegar for a dressing, and she snacks on almonds. So should we be concerned about the types of fat if our diet is mostly fat? And I think yes. I took this picture last week at my local health food store, and I just thought, wow, we are so spoiled here. We have all of these options, all of these fats, but actually not one of them in the picture is, would be something I would recommend to people. So I know I have to provide them with uh, advice on which are the, the best, and it's easiest to tell them first which ones to avoid. So I'm probably gonna get hate mail after this from the food industry, but these are the facts. There are damaged fats deep fried foods, hydrogenated oils, and those are the ones that have trans fats. Heating oils to high temperature, even olive oil, which is an excellent oil, if you heat it high, you're oxidating it, not good. So you, um, you don't want to heat uh, oils um, for sauteing very high. Processed polyunsaturated fats, bottled salad dressings, most of them are soybean oil, imitation cheeses, margarine, and mayonnaise from soybean oil. Thankfully, there's a couple brands out that are avocado oil. Are saturated fats okay? Yes. In 2015, our federal government finally admitted that saturated fats don't cause heart disease and um, you can feel comfortable eating them. Um, whoops. Seed and fruit. Uh, MCT oils, you're hearing about that a lot. And I want to show you in this chart, um, these are the saturated fats in our food supply, most of them, and these fruit oils and animal fats are highest in saturated fat. The monounsaturated, which we know um, are really good for us, are in the middle here, and these are also great sources of omega-3 of omega and omega-6. We really don't need to be eating these high polyunsaturated fats, um, on, especially on a daily basis. Um, but these, the, these two here are really the best 
because they provide all the fats that we need and we can take them in large amounts. Um, people are often very worried about omega-3s and 6, and um, too much omega-6 can interfere with that omega-3 metabolism. And uh, um, the high, highest concentration of DHA and EPA from omega-3 are quality marine oils, such as cod liver or krill. So I have mostly adults that are taking this in a pill form to make sure they get it, but we can get it from our food sources as well. Uh, unique oils with micronutrients, extra virgin olive oil, as I mentioned, not only omega-3, but vitamin E, K1, uh, ubiquinol. This is like medicine. This is so good for us. Avocado oil also, vitamin A, thiamine, riboflavin, and lecithin. And this is more heat stable than olive oil. So if you're going to saute eggs or whatever, use, use avocado oil instead. And then superfoods, and, and I have this one out at the table too, but I, I really like to feed people nutrient-dense carbs. Um, I've turned a lot of people on to sprouting. These are uh, the sprout category here. It's very easy to do at home. This is like the, the kitchen uh, garden that um, is so easy and healthful to do. It's wonderful to teach children to do this. Vitamins and minerals are essential in the diet, and this should be individualized. A multivitamin supplement that's carb-free, there's actually several out, but you really, you really have to watch and look at ingredients and look for quality products. Um, minerals, I have um, most of my patients getting calcium some, and vitamin D if they're not in a sunny climate like yours, um, vitamin D and some with magnesium. Uh, children specifically, I also, also provide phosphorus, and then most of my patients also need a little bit of electrolyte support, and that can be as easy as um, salting their foods or Morton light salt, which I prefer because not only do you get the sodium, but there's a little bit of potassium and you get the chloride too. So I have people using like a quarter of a teaspoon or an eighth of a teaspoon a day getting, getting into their water or putting it on their food. It doesn't really matter how they take it in or if they take it in all at once. And then other nutritional support. These are very individualized based on what's going on. Um, gastrointestinal support. Chia seeds have fiber, flax seeds have fiber, avocados have not only fiber but magnesium. And um, I've got a lot of people off of their laxatives by just eating avocado regularly. Sunflower seeds and egg yolk have lecithin, and that's helpful in digesting fats. And then I've used pancreatic enzymes in people that were pretty sick, that, uh, that they uh, just needed a little bit of support in order to um, process the fat in their diet and, and stay on the diet. And metabolic and cardiac, um, I've not had a lot of ex experience with exogenous ketones, um, but that's, I know that's on the horizon as being a helpful adjunct to this therapy, um, and then these other supplements. And I'm getting the, um, the hook here to speed up my last slide. So um, I do want to emphasize that electrolyte replacement is necessary specifically for exercise during the heat, fasting, or six days. And this is my little recipe. I basically took Pedialyte and mimicked it by using salts and water. And um, so you can um, Contact me if you need that recipe, otherwise if, hopefully you, you took a snapshot of that. But that's also, also published in our materials at the Charlie Foundation. Be good to your gut because this impacts so much of our immune system um, and our overall health. Um, our liver converts fat to ketones, so if we're, if we're pounding our liver with toxic food and medications, it really um, struggles to help us uh, overcome whatever, whatever condition we are trying to recover from. The saboteurs are processed foods, acid blockers, statins, and antibiotics, and these have been mentioned a couple times in the past few days. Um, and probiotics, this is really hot stuff in nutrition. You can eat your probiotics, you can take a supplement, I recommend both, um, but getting a variety. And I, I uh, mentioned um, kombucha before, and I think uh, this is a, a fantastic probiotic. It also has the benefit of um, having butyric acid, which um, feeds your um, uh, colon and, and is super healthy. Um, 
you have to watch out for the carb content, so making it at home again. This is an easy thing to make at home if you have a little bit of time. That your first batch is always the most time and um, intense, but that after that you realize it's quite simple. And then food safety. A lot of people ask me about um, endocrine disruptors and carcinogens. And there's a wonderful website that um, will educate you about safe foods and, and non-safe foods. And so just in summary, I want to acknowledge the Charlie Foundation for um, supporting me and, and helping to um, promote their mission, which is edu education and advocacy. And um, Jim, who happens to be a Hollywood movie writer and producer, uh, wrote this film called First Do No Harm, which is the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take. Um, and he um, has brought the ketogenic diet out of the closet and probably is responsible for a lot of the um, generation of n new research. This is Charlie here who had been on the diet for five years uh, for epilepsy. Seizure free, he's now 23, he's certified um, uh, teacher and works with young children, is doing fabulously. Um, and then finally, People were asking about where do you go to get help from a nutritionist. The Charlie Foundation has vetted about 12 um, health professionals, and some of them are here with me at the table, and you can stop by and, and chat with them afterwards during the, during the lunch break, I should say, um, and we hope to expand on this. Thank you very much.